Congratulations for making it all the way to the last lecture <laughs> of the school. Yeah, usually having, having the spot after lunch is never a good idea, but well, that's what the organizers gave me, so we have to endure one more lecture after lunch. That's it. Um, So I've decided to call this lecture Applications. But before we go into the lecture, let's uh, let's quickly review what we did yesterday. So did yesterday was to develop further the conjecture that any scattering amplitude in any number of dimensions at three level could be written as a special integral over the moduli space of Riemann spheres with m mark points times some, maybe we can write it like this, a full integrand. So let's write this a little bit more explicitly. So yesterday we said we have the integration over the variables. And then they are localized on the support of the scattering equations. And we have our total integrand. Now, what this meant, this was just a fancy notation for saying that if we fix mark the mark points P, Q, and R, then we remove them from the measure and we introduce the van der Monde determinant of them. And this prime here meant that we were supposed to remove three equations. And today I came out with a better notation for the, for the three things we're going to remove. They're going to be i, j, and k. And we have the remaining ones written here. Now, what these van der Monde determinants were are simply collections of differences of locations of punctures or mark points. And let me remind you that our notation was that sigma with two indices meant the difference of the two points on the sphere. So we had a sphere with points sigma 1, sigma 2, all the way to sigma n. OK? Very good. Now, each of these equations was given as something of this form. Now I want to give the precise formula at the end of the day for what this means. Okay, so whenever you have delta functions, all you have to do is basically make a change of variables, call your EAs, the basic variables of your integration, and make a change of variables. After you have done that, and transform your integration in terms of an integration where the EAs, then the delta functions just set the EAs to zero, and all that happens is that you pay the price of a Jacobian. So let's compute that Jacobian. So we are supposed to compute the Jacobian matrix of making that change of variables. So we have to compute derivatives of these functions with respect to the sigmas. Now clearly, if A is different from B, what we get is something of the form SAB sigma AB squared. 
Now, if we have the same, the same index, then what we get is minus the sum of SAB, sigma AB squared, from 1 to n, for B different from A. So it's very tempting to introduce a new matrix, right? So we had already the matrix K, that was the matrix of Mandelstam invariants. We also had the matrix A. which doesn't have a name, but whose matrix elements are sigma AB, SAB over sigma AB. And now we can introduce a new matrix, let's call it phi. We have a, a third matrix. matrix elements are even of this in this form. Okay. So these are n by n matrices that we can naturally construct. So what do you think is the core rank of this matrix? I'm also testing if you know what the core rank means. So, so what's the core rank of that matrix? Well, it's actually one. But, so the core rank is nothing but this. How big the matrix is minus the rank, OK? So this object has rank n minus 1. The core rank is 1. How about the core rank of this one? We said it yesterday. Do you remember? It was 2. And the core rank of this one, we also said it yesterday, happens to be 3. What are the null vectors? The null vector of this object is 1, 1, 1. The null vector of these guys, of the two null vectors of this guy, this one and sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma n. And this one has the previous two and an extra one. Sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, sigma n squared. Okay? So mathematicians are very familiar with matrices with rank 1 when the sum of the columns and the sums of the rows are up to 0. They happen all the time in graph theory. And they define, it's very standard for them to define the determinant prime of that matrix to be the determinant of the submetrix computed by or obtained by removing the i-th column and the j-th row. And it's pretty standard for them to tell you, or for them it's very, it's, um, they all know that this object is independent of the choice of i and j. Okay? Now, for this matrix, that wouldn't be that obvious for them because it doesn't quite appear as far as I know in combinatorics. But this one, we can also define a determinant prime of A as the determinant of A after removing the i and j row and the k and l column. And the only thing is that we pay the price of this factor. What do you think we have to do for this one? Well, the same thing. So we get determinant prime of phi is going to be defined. So here, nothing depends on the choice. And here, nothing will depend on the choice either. And we're going to get the determinant of phi after you remove p, q, and r rows and i, j, and k columns. And the price you pay are these van der Monde determinants PQR and IJK. 
Why am I doing all this? Why do you think? Look at this formula here. So when you compute this object, well, you already see the two van der Monde determinants. And now, by performing these integrations, all we do is to pick up the Jacobian of the change of variables. But how is the Jacobian constructed? It's the m minus 3 by m minus 3 matrix, where we take the equations, removing these three, and take derivatives with respect to all variables except these three. Isn't that the determinant prime of phi? So what we conclude from here is that our formula, which started as an integral for any amplitude, is not really an integral. It's a sum over all the solutions to the scattering equations of nothing but one over the determinant prime of the matrix phi evaluated on the sigmas that were computed by the i-th solution to the scattering equations times whatever full integrand we have evaluated on the sigmas corresponding to the i-th solution. Okay? So today we're going to see what we can learn what applications this formula has. Okay. But we're still reviewing. So what else did we do yesterday? So we discussed the formula for Young Mills and gravity. We introduced yet even, even a new matrix, okay? So this whole business has been about introducing matrices and computing determinants, Fafians, and they always seem to have these primes. So I don't really know why is that happening. So these primes are signs of redundancies. So somehow you have to introduce these redundancies in order to get um, the formulas to work. So let's write our matrix psi. And remember that the matrix is nicely decomposed into four blocks. Each one of the blocks, we can easily remember it by listing the momenta, listing the polarization vectors, and then writing the corresponding contractions. Remember that for me, in this part of the board, for this matrix, SIJ means KI dot KJ. So I'm removing the factor of two. It's just to save writing. So this matrix is anti-symmetric. So we should have zeros all the way here. And we're going to have here SN1, sigma N1, SN2, sigma N2, all the way here. Likewise. This goes all the way to S m minus 1 n, sigma m minus 1 n. On this side, we started yesterday with our first try and wrote a zero. That didn't work. So we ended up changing this for something that we call C11. And on this side, minus C11. And the rest are the obvious contractions. So we have K1 epsilon 2 sigma 1, 2, all the way to k1 epsilon n, sigma 1 n, all the way to c n n. And here we have k n dot epsilon 1, sigma n 1. You might wonder why am I doing all this? <laughs> I mean, we did it yesterday, right? So why am I going through all this detail and writing all this? So there is a good reason. So, I know it's incredibly boring, but, but we're going to see something nice. I promise. And now we're going to see, let's go, let, let's go along this line. So we're going to get the last one is easy, CNN. And now when we go along this line, we have to contract epsilon 1 with KN, sigma 1N, epsilon 2, KN, sigma 2N. OK? Very good. 
And we said that for gravity, our formula was something like this, times the product of two Fafians, but we can take it to be the determinant. Charge density. So who is charge? Oh, yeah, so, so k1 dot epsilon 1 is 0, right? So c11 was not, we, we, that, that wouldn't be the correct identification. So yesterday we started with 0, and we found that we had to modify. So that reminds me, yeah, we should have written what these things are. So caa is defined to be the contraction of the polarization A with everyone else except the one that you see, except itself, because you will get zero, right? So we have something like this, and we have b from 1 to m, OK? So that was the definition we found. Do you remember the reason we had to cook up this strange formula? The reason was that we wanted to reduce the number of powers of momenta of this determinant, or the Fafian, and the way to do it was by forcing the matrix to have more null eigenvectors. And the way to force it was by cooking up these diagonal terms so that the null eigenvector, the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, and then 0, 0, 0 would become a null eigenvector. And once we did that, we bought ourselves two null eigenvectors instead of one. So we got two for the price of one. That was a great, a great deal. And those two allowed us to remove two rows and two columns from this part of the matrix. And therefore, we were able to reduce the number of powers of momenta by two, precisely what we needed in order to construct yang mills amplitudes. OK? Very good. Now, what do we want to do with this? So I promised that we would do something nice with this formula, and that's why we were writing it. So the first application, so now we can start the lecture. The first application of this formula would be the derivation of Weinberg's soft theorem. Here we're only going to do the leading order, but even the sub-leading and sub-sub-leading orders would be more or less similar to what I'm going to explain. And I'm going to point out where you have to modify the argument to get the other, the other two. So application number one. All right. So what do we want? Let's do it for gravity. You would think that Young Mills would be easier, but actually gravity is even easier than Young Mills. So let's do it for gravity. So consider particle n to be soft. Okay. As usual, we're not going to take the momentum to be identically zero. We're just going to take the limit and keep the leading order terms. Okay. Now you're already familiar with what happens to the scattering equations. Because during the first lecture on the scattering equations, we used this argument precisely to count the number of solutions to the scattering equations. So we know that the scattering equations are split into two. So it would be nice to separate this equation from the rest. So this equation will leave it by itself. And the remaining equations, we write them explicitly as the sum from 1 to m minus 1, SAB, sigma AB, plus SAN, sigma AN. And since we are doing only the leading order, that's great, because we can now 
cancel this term. If you want to compute the sub-leading order, or the sub-sub-leading order, or even you can go to any order that you want, you could then, well, you could not. You have to keep this term. Okay? So if you want to attempt the next orders, you have to keep this term. But for this lecture, we're going to drop it. And therefore, these are the scattering equations for n minus 1 particles. Okay. So we start with our formula for gravity as the integral over the product over all particles and all the scattering equations and the determinant prime of this big matrix psi for n particles. But now, in this limit, we know we can separate this thing and write this as an integral from 1 to m minus 1, d sigma a. I'm going to keep here the volume of SL to C. I don't want to write which particles we are removing and so on. The only thing that you should remember is that we are not fixing sigma n. That's the only thing that I don't want to do. So I don't want to use SL to C to fix sigma n. And here, we just have delta prime of everybody except n and the three equations that I'm removing, OK? Here, I'm going to put the integration over sigma n because I didn't fix it, so I have to keep it, as well as the nth equation that is going to impose constraints on sigma n. Now we have the determinant prime of psi for n particles. Okay. Now, once you look at this formula, it looks pretty much hopeless, because we know that this part will localize all the punctures or all the mark points to some crazy locations. And we have to put all those crazy locations into this equation which I remind you is sum over SAN, or NNA, for A from 1 to M minus 1. So let me write this explicitly as sigma M minus sigma A, and put here the I that indicates that for any solution of this, for, this, for any of the M minus 4 factorial solutions that we're going to get, we have to compute this. So it seems there is no hope whatsoever of pulling out the soft factor. But let's study what this matrix does. Maybe that will give us a hint. Well, now you know the reason why I spent time writing this carefully. The reason is that we can identify what happens in the leading to leading order in the soft limit. So we look at the matrix, and what we have to pay attention to are these this column, and this row. So since I'm doing the leading order, and you are going to do the sub-leading order, then I'm free to set all these things to zero. And this one's to zero. And this one's to zero. But I have to stop here. This one doesn't even have Kn. You see, the definition doesn't involve it. So these two pieces are the only ones that survive from this column and from this row. But isn't that so? If you have to compute the, the determinant of a matrix and you're given the choice of which row or which column to expand this determinant, which one would you choose? I hope you wouldn't choose this one, right? That wouldn't be very good. So you, I would choose this one. So once you choose this one, you get this times the determinant of the matrix obtained by removing this whole row and this whole column. But after you do that, you're left with another determinant that you have to compute. But guess what? That determinant itself has another beautiful row this time that has plenty of zeros and only one element that is not zero. So you can compute this new determinant by expanding along this row and you get this term times 
the determinant of the submetrics obtained by removing this. But that submetrix is nothing but the submetrics for the system that you would write if you only had n minus 1 particles. Now, the only dependence of particle n in the submetrix is in these diagonal terms. But we can do the same thing that we did. Well, I can do it. You cannot do it, because you're going to do the sub, the sub leading term. But since I'm doing the leading term, all I have to do is to remove this term from the calculation. And therefore, all dependence here has dropped. And there is no dependence on the polarization vector for the nth particle anywhere here. So I hope I've convinced you that this object now becomes C and n squared times the determinant of the matrix that you would write for n minus 1 particles. So that looks much, much better than before, right? So the situation seems a little bit more under control. So now we can pull this out and put it in front of here, which I'm going to do by saying that we have the integral over the measure for n minus 1 particles of determinant prime of psi for n minus 1 particle times the integral d sigma n for this thing, still with this scattering equation in psi. But this time, we have c and n squared. Still, the situation seems a little hopeless because CNN square depends on all the sigmas, including sigma n. So at this point, I remember we were about to give up and say, no, this is impossible. There is no way this is going to give the soft theorems. Maybe the whole formula is wrong. So you get depressed. But how come if you do, if, if we had calculated some examples, and maybe we did three, four particles, five particles, they work. So how come that this formula is not giving the right soft theorem? You see why it seems hopeless, right? Because this localizes your object to this bunch of solutions. And everything here depends on that. Okay? Now let's do the following. Let's treat this the function as if it was a pole and we were doing a contour integral. So what I'm doing is the following. I'm thinking that this object now this is CNN. Yes. This guy doesn't depend on the nth particle, right? Yeah, so so I, I was able to pull it out. So that was progress, but still. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. And this thing, is a, we have to compute all the solutions, and this thing will depend on all that. So it seems completely hopeless to pull out anything. Now, I'm going to replace the formula with the delta function by the following. Contour integral dz over z of f of z around z equals 2. Okay? That's the replacement I'm going to make. So what do I have? Let me just look at that integral. So we have, and I'm going to write CNN explicitly. Let me also write the equation explicitly. So once you see it like this, say, wow, this is starting to look good, right? It's almost like the kind of things that should appear in the soft theorem, except that it's all mixed with things that you don't want. Now, what's the contour? Now, 
Now we are on the sigma m plane, and what's the contour? What are the poles of this function? Well, we have, at the very least, the m minus 3 places where this vanishes. So let me denote those by these dots. And our contour encloses each one of them, because we are, that's what we were instructed to do. But this function also has other poles. Where are the other poles? Well, clearly here, every time sigma n hits another sigma, this will blow up, right? So we will have other poles located at sigma 1, sigma 2. Well, if sigma n approaches sigma 1 here, this blows up, right? But it's in the denominator, so that's a zero. When sigma n approaches sigma 1 here, you get more excitement, right? So there is a chance to get something interesting. Very good. Now, we know that if we have to sum over these solutions, the situation is hopeless completely. So what would you do? Well, you will use Cauchy's residue theorem, right? You will join all these contours together. So let's actually put them together and say that this contour was really this contour. And now you deform this contour and pick up each one of these contributions. So now you even remove this contour and deform it. and possibly get a contribution at infinity as well, OK? So we have transformed the problem of computing this complicated object into computing n possibly complicated objects. So it doesn't sound very good, but let's see what happens. So let's first check what happens at infinity. I don't think we need this. You know it very well by now. So what happens at infinity? We have to take this function and study what happens when sigma n is approaching infinity. So let's study the numerator. So this thing can be written as the leading order would be of the form sigma n ka epsilon n ka sigma n plus order 1 over sigma n squared sum over a. Do you agree? We're expanding around sigma n equals to infinity. So this is irrelevant to the leading order. And the next to leading order is 1 over sigma n squared because we are expanding around sigma n very large. So in fact, let me write this as something over sigma n squared plus higher orders. Now you see that when I pull out the polarization vector epsilon n and sigma n outside, I get the sum over all the momenta. And by momentum conservation, I get kn, which kills this term. So this is epsilon n over sigma n dot the sum of the momenta, which by momentum conservation happens to be minus kn, and it gets zero. So this is the leading order. The same thing happens for the other one. In fact, that's what we did during the lecture when we first discussed the scattering equations. So this one also behaves like something over sigma n squared. And when we put it here, what's the behavior when sigma n goes to infinity? We see that we get something that in the numerator goes as 1 over sigma n squared squared, and in the denominator, 1 over sigma n squared. And this thing goes like 1 over sigma n squared, precisely right to vanish, not even room to spare. Why is that the case? I still don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm glad it worked, but... Uh, um, 
You see, if it had been 1 over sigma n, we would have gotten a pole at infinity. If it had been 1 over sigma n squared, a cube, then there would have been room to, for, for playing around. But the square is just right, and there is nothing else you can do. So there is no pole at infinity. The rest is gone. And all we have to worry about are these locations. Now we see something interesting. Let's compute the residue. Now we have the sum over all these poles. So let's go from 1 to n minus 1. We're doing this integral where sigma n minus sigma a is integrated on a tiny circle around sigma a, sigma n of that formula. Yes. Well, the room for improvement, um, every time you get something that vanishes more than what it should at infinity, it means that you could perhaps take derivatives with respect to external data to, to get something else that has a power of sigma n inside, and still the soft theorem would have worked, or still your, your argument would have worked. Here, there is nothing you can think about. Now, when we go around this contour, in this sum, there is only one term that contributes, right? The term that is the leading order when we are in this contour is precisely the eighth one. And in the denominator is precisely the nth one as well, sorry, the eighth one. But you see that this one has a zero as a function, and this one has a double pole, precisely to give you a simple pole at that location. And therefore, this object evaluates to something that is completely independent of the other sigmas. All the dependence on the complicated solutions has completely gone away. And not only that, we know, well, you now know that very well, each of these things come from these little stick figures where particle A gets particle N attached to it. So somehow we are seeing the emergence of these Feynman diagrams as a consequence of this residue theorem. Now that this object is completely independent of the sigmas, we can call it S0, and go back to our formula, remove it from here, and now we can put it where it belongs, in front. And this object can be directly identified as the n-1 particle amplitude. So we have discovered that in the soft limit, the graviton amplitude factorizes as S0 times the n minus 1 particle amplitude. And we have recovered the soft theorem. So now your exercise is to repeat everything for the subleading and the sub subleading and convince yourself or try the next order and see what goes wrong. Is there something that goes wrong? Can you still write something meaningful for the third order? Sorry, for the fourth. Very good. And we still have time for another application. So application number two, unless there is any question about this. No, that's your, that's, that's your, no, yeah. <laughs> that's always cheating. You, give a, you, get a, you get homework and then you ask, what's the, <laughs> oh, these guys are the n minus three roots of En equals to zero. The N minus three solutions of this equation, which is here, right? So these are poles. Every time this is zero, these are poles. Okay. 
So the next application Let's write the formula that, a formula that we had at the beginning of the lecture here, which is that this is also the sum over all n minus 3 factorial solutions of 1 over the determinant prime of phi evaluated on the ith solution times this in full integrand evaluated on the ith solution. And this was completely general. So the second application is I'll call it operations on theories. And to do that, I'm going to go back to the very basic object that we studied at the beginning of these lectures, which was the bi-adjoint scalar amplitude. Now, alpha and beta here are permutations of labels. So far, I've always chosen alpha to be the identity and beta to be omega. But today, we need both of them to vary. So let's choose them. Let's call them alpha and beta, since none of them is, is, uh, is going to be the identity. And what is this? Let's write this in terms of our new formula. Okay. So let's write this as the sum from 1 to n minus 3 factorial of 1 over the determinant prime of phi, 1 over. Here I'm going to introduce another notation so that I can save some writing. So if you remember, I'm supposed to write something like sigma 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, all the way to n1. But instead of doing this, I'm going to write 1 over 1, 2, 3, or up to n, just with brackets. And even better, now you see how lazy I am. Now here, this is just alpha. Evaluated at the ith solution, and this is 1 over beta evaluated at the ith solution. OK? Now, this is not going to be Perhaps at first it's not going to look very, very intuitive, but the reason I'm going to do it is the following. You see that the number of permutations that we have, well, from here it seems to be n factorial. But remember that these are objects that multiply traces, and traces are symmetric, are cyclic. In fact, these objects are cyclic. So we don't have n factorial. We have n minus 1 factorial. Now we have n minus 1 factorial permutations, so this looks like a matrix that is n minus 1 factorial by n minus 1 factorial. And we have n minus 3 factorial solutions to the scattering equations. So it's almost tempting to think that there could be some sort of duality between this space of color and the space of solutions of the scattering equations. Of course, it doesn't seem to work because the numbers don't match. But still, both of them grow factorially. So maybe it's worth exploring. So the way I'm going to explore it is as follows. I'm going to try to write this also as a matrix. So I'm going to introduce another index, j. And then a delta function that locks the two indices i and j. I haven't done anything interesting so far, right? This is just a trivial identity. So it's never a good idea to start erasing when you just said something trivial, because then people don't, don't spend time actually thinking about something deep. But, uh, but in any case, so this was a little break. So, this is something completely trivial. And what I want to do is the following. Allow me to write this matrix Let me introduce this matrix M, which we said was M minus 1 factorial by M minus 1 factorial. OK? Now, I want to pick 
speak from here, remember, I want to impose or try to explore the idea of some duality between color and solutions of the scattering equations. So in order to do that, this matrix is n minus 3 factorial by n minus 3 factorial. So I should try and pick from here a submatrix of the same size. And that's what I'm going to do by selecting from here some submatrix by choosing permutations in a set A that belongs to the set of all permutations and which has order n minus 3 factorial. And from here, I'm going to do the same thing with a set B that also has order n minus 3 factorial. So I'm going to construct my new matrix M. So this one, you see the difference between this M and that M? A little subtle, but so this, this line here. This is the big matrix, and this is a submatrix of n minus 3 factorial by n minus 3 factorial size. So now, in terms of this matrix, I'm going to write this equation as a matrix equation. So on this side, I'm going to have the matrix M. I'm going to give a name to this. I'm going to call it a matrix U, which is now a square matrix, right? Because I'm only summing over n minus 3 factorial permutations and n minus 3 factorial indices here. I'm going to call this matrix D, for obvious reasons. And this matrix, I'm going to call it V. Okay. Now you see that the reason I'm calling these two matrices differently is that the two sets, alpha and B, A and B, don't have to be the same. So these matrices don't have to be the same. So let's write that matrix equation. Maybe if I want to be pedantic, I'll put the transpose times D times V. Now we can compute the inverse of this equation, crossing our fingers. Why do I have to cross my fingers? Because it could be that something, some of these matrices don't have inverses. But let's pretend that they do and see if we land on something interesting. Now I'm going to remove these things, because what I want to do is to produce some sort of resolution of the identity in the space of scattering equations. In terms of vectors, or a basis in the space of colors. So now I multiply by V, M inverse, and U transpose on this side, and I get the inverse. OK? So this is going to be the main engine of many identities we're going to discover. Well, most of them were already discovered by other means, but still, it doesn't remove the excitement of reconstructing them from something, from something new. Now, how do you think we can use this formula? Consider any theory. Yes. No, there are. We remove many more than two. <laughs> you see how many we remove? <laughs> yes. <laughs> n minus one factorial minus n minus three factorial. Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's what you said. Yes. No, I didn't. I didn't forget about them. Well, no. Yes, I did forget about them. But. Uh, um, I said, well, we don't need them. Because I want to construct a matrix that has the same size as the space of scattering equation solutions. So I'm just saying, well, let's choose that. Let's choose a submatrix that does that. In fact, what you can show is that if you go even one more, you grow this matrix one more size, the determinant vanishes. Take, take this guy. And now say, no, look, I, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, myself. And you're talking. And you say, I'm going to go and increase this thing by one. So what can go wrong? Just add one more thing. Well, it turns out that the determinant of this matrix 
is zero. No matter what choice you make. So you are stuck with the choice that I made. <laughs> okay. So now consider a general theory. For no reason whatsoever, I'm going to call it capital M. But don't, don't be prejudiced. There are no prejudices about why I'm calling this general theory capital M. Okay? It's so general that I'm just going to write it as a left half integrand times a right half integrand. From now on, in this derivation, I'll drop the half. But just to, just to show off, please. These are two half integrands in the sense of the weight they carry with respect to SL to C. Okay. So let's write it again as a sum over I over all the solutions. But you see that after we did this beautiful derivation over here and got this spectacular result, then it's obvious what I have to do here what I have to do. I want to write it like this. Just what I did for this equation, I'm going to do it exactly for that, but with I left and I right. So let me do it. So I and J from 1 to M minus 3 factorial. So we're going to have I left evaluated on the i solution divided by the determinant prime of phi on the i solution delta ij, and then here i right, but evaluated on the j solution. Okay? In fact, so I, put the, I even put this guy in the wrong place. So you have been under this. Okay, very good. Did I put it in the wrong place? No, I totally had it in the right place. Ah, doesn't matter. Well, so what I want to do now is to use this equation and put it in there, OK? But you would say, well, here you got d and not the inverse. Well, not such a big deal, right? So if I want to have the inverse in this equation, all I have to do is to put this guy where I had it before. then multiply and divide by another copy of this thing, and the other copy, I'm going to put it here, times this thing here. You see that now it looks better? Yes. This is for the bioengineering scalar, yes. Yeah, here we're considering a completely general theory that seems to have nothing to do with a bijoin scalar, except that I know that the, the identity in the space of solutions of the scattering equations can be written in terms of the inverse matrix of the bijoin scalar times these mysterious matrices U and V. So let's use the identity in this equation and see what happens. So now this is the inverse i and j, OK? I hope you all agree. So just bear with me for three more minutes, and you will see what's going to happen. So now, let me use this formula. Instead of the inverse, I'm going to put this into the, into the equation. So I'm going to have sum over i and j of i left determinant prime of phi on i sum over alpha and beta of 1 over alpha i, right, times m inverse alpha beta of 1 over beta j times I write j over 
determinant prime of phi j. This is starting to look very good. Well, maybe not yet. Um, what would you do now if you're given this formula? Remember, what we are trying to do is to find connections. Look at the title of this part of the talk. It's operations on theories. So we want to make connections between different theories. So we started with this general theory, with these integrants, and somehow we should get something else that has to do with theories. But we know how to write general theories, right? So we write general theories in this form with a full integrand. So we should try to get, no matter how, we should try to get that from this formula. But it's fairly easy, right? All we have to do is to pull out the sum over permutations from this whole thing and rearrange things and magically we get the product to amplitudes. So let me write it explicitly. What we just found is that this general theory can be written as the sum over permutations belonging to A and beta belonging to B of what? Of the sum over i from 1 to n minus 3 factorial of 1 over determinant prime of phi, 1 over alpha evaluated at i times the integral left evaluated at i times the elements alpha and beta of the inverse of the matrix M multiplying the same thing But this object is the integral over mu n of 1 over alpha i left. And this object here is the integral over mu n of 1 over beta with i right. So somehow we have decomposed a theory into a sum of products of two theories that carry a color structure that wasn't there at the beginning. So all of a sudden we found a way of decomposing something into things that have an emerging color structure. Can you think of any application? Maybe as an application we can start with something that doesn't have color at the beginning. What would you try? Yes, we are only looking at three-level amplitudes, but if by any chance all this formalism works at loop level, then we could also generalize this. And in fact, some people have been able to generalize what I'm saying to one loop, because that's where the formula exists so far. Okay? So any ideas? If you're given that formula, how would you try it? So I don't know. The first thing that I would try is to let I left to be the same as I right equals to the Fafian prime of psi. Wouldn't you? <laughs> so if you did that, what would be M in that formula? So M starts its life here. And I'm choosing these two guys to be Fafian prime of A. So we get Fafian prime of A times Fafian prime of A which happens to be the determinant prime of psi, sorry, it's not a, but of psi. And what theory was that? Gravity. So we get that a gravity amplitude can be written as a sum over permutations. Now of what? The first term in the formula happens to be, this is Fafian prime of psi, with an ordering, but that's also known as the young mills partial amplitude with ordering alpha times the inverse 
of a matrix made out of Bayer-Ewing scalars. There is nothing easier than computing the entries of that matrix. It's just a cubic scalar theory, just simple little rules. You compute the entries, you compute the inverse, and you stick it in here, times another copy of Young Mills with order in beta. Now, this object here, so M inverse of alpha and beta, was actually the object discovered by KLT, which is usually denoted as S, alpha and beta. But it wasn't realized that it was the inverse of a matrix of amplitudes until this derivation was found. So this object was found already by KLT in the 80s. And this is the connection between open string amplitudes and closed string amplitudes in the limit or in the field theory limit when alpha prime goes to zero. You get back a field theoretic formula and a field theoretic formula. Okay? Very good. So we still have time for one more application. Well, maybe let me say that now you can just sit down and enjoy all possibilities here. Take anything that you want to be I left and to be I right. So let's take this guy. If you take this guy to be the determinant prime of A, what happens? So let me write it too. So now let's take, we will get determinant prime squared of A. And I told you the name of the theory. I mean, maybe you haven't seen what the theory is, but it's a scalar theory with many, many derivatives. And that was, I told you it was, uh, it had a name. The Galilean theory, okay? Some, some scalar theory, which for some reason, which is still not completely deeply understood, shows up here. So it's a theory that has many derivative interactions and whose S matrix can be computed by just using the determinant prime of A for the two half integrands. But now you discover that this theory can be written as a sum over alpha and beta in the same way here, but with amplitudes in what theory? In the theory of pions or what is called as the nonlinear sigma model. So this is just one example of many attempts, or many, sorry, no attempts, I mean, you, you actually, if you try, you succeed, because we have proven the formula, okay? So of many ways of deriving connections among theories that were not known before. Okay? Very good, yes. Well, we don't have a, there isn't a nicely consistent theory of the Galileans in terms of a string theory. I mean, a string theory doesn't, at least so far, nobody has been able to construct it from a string theory. From ambi twister space, it's possible with many supersymmetries on the world sheet, but then that lowers the, the space time dimension to be too small. And this is true in any number of dimensions. Choose 27 dimensions. So we don't have supersymmetry. So this is true in any number of dimensions. And it still holds. Yes, yeah, so I haven't made any assumptions on the number of dimensions. So this is completely general. Sorry? There are no super conformal field theories. And definitely, I'm not assuming that these theories are conformal and not super anything. 
Couldn't you just write, uh, couldn't you write down junk meals in any number of dimensions? What prevents you from putting a D instead of putting four? We're doing three levels, so not to worry. Oh, so maybe we should do that. Okay, very good. So next application. <laughs> Color kinematics. What about color kinematics? Yeah, people would think that I planted the question, but no, it's, it's completely, completely random. I'll give you the twenty dollars later. <laughs> Well, uh, let's let, let's see let, let's see what we can do, and let's see how close we can get to color kinematics. Yeah, I mean this looks very tempting, but remember, if you look into your notes, the color kinematics duality we discussed at the beginning of the of the course was completely different. It had trivalent graphs with numerators. Where are the trivalent graphs here? They don't seem to be anywhere. But that's the key. We should find them. Okay, so let's let's start again with the most general form of this thing. Um, so, I'm not even going to assume that this is Young Mills or the nonlinear sigma model. Let's call them theory left and theory right. Okay? So, from the beginning, I'm just going to say that this is theory on the left, theory on the right, and this is whatever general theory we have. And I'm going to write this again as some sort of matrix equation. So this is a vector of amplitudes in color space, right? So we have some vector of amplitudes in color space. So how many components are in this vector? So this object belongs to C n minus 3 factorial. Because remember, I'm choosing alpha and beta to be elements of these sets, which were chosen to be n minus 3 factorial in size, OK? Times this matrix M inverse times A right. OK? Now, what I'm going to do is the following. Since I want to have trivalent graphs, I want to get them somehow, no matter how I how I do it, I want to get them. But trivalent graphs are in M. So if I could only get an M instead of M inverse, I would be in business. Well, why not do the following? Take this. There you go. I got an M. I wanted an M. <laughs> Here is the M. Now let me put these guys like this, and let's give a name to this thing. Let's call this F left, and this thing F right. So let's write this explicitly again. So this is a sum over alpha and beta of F left alpha, M alpha beta, F right beta. Now, this looks very, very close, but it still is not the, the color kinematics duality that BCJ proposed, right? But well, let's not give up, especially we're only nine minutes away from the end of the lecture. So let's just keep going for a little. What is this in terms of Feynman diagrams? This M alpha beta was defined as the sum over all trivalent graphs that belong to the set. So let me define, let me define here O alpha is the set of all trivalent graphs You see, the O is really a circle. 
okay? Compatible or with alpha. What do we mean by that? Well, take the O, which I told you is a circle, and draw alpha. And a graph is compatible with this ordering if the graph can be drawn in a planar way on this disk. In other words, if you can take your trivalent graph and twist it in any way you like and draw it here without any crossings. Okay? So that's the definition of this set. So here, this is the sum over all graphs that belong to this and also belong to O beta. One over the product over all propagators corresponding to the edges of the graph So now, what do I do? Well, we're this close. Now, at least this thing is the thing that appears in the, in the color kinematics duality. But it's still all entangled. There are these permutations, and in color kinematics there are no permutations, especially constraining the graphs. So this, this symbol is AND. Okay? So, let me propose a way of writing this object that will help us a little bit. So the way we're going to do it is knowing that I want to land on the color kinematics duality, I'm going to sum over all trivalent graphs. So these are all. So I have to write something here that gives me back this formula. Let's see if I can come out with something in five minutes. Well. Before we do that, let me hope for the best and put this here. And all I have to do is to write some projection operator that kills every graph that doesn't do what I want. Well, how would that be? Well, let me sum over all graphs, gamma tilde, that belong to O alpha and kill every graph in this set that doesn't belong to this set. And let me write this, gamma double tilde, as all graphs that belong to or are compatible with beta and kill every graph that doesn't belong to it. So I've multiplied, I'm summing over all graphs, I'm multiplying by the projection operators that projects me into the space of graphs that are compatible with alpha, and then the space of graphs that are compatible with beta. Whatever survives one has to pass the other test in order to make it to the party here, okay? Okay, now given this formula, let's put it back in there and see what happens. So now it's clear what I want to do, right? I want to put this outside of the sum. After all, this part doesn't depend on alpha and beta. That's what I wanted, right? So I'm going to have the sum over gamma, all trivalent graphs, one over the product of all propagators, or just the skeleton of the graph. Now I'm going to put everything that depends on alpha on one side. So there is a sum over alpha belonging to the set A, sum over all gamma tildes that belong to O alpha, delta gamma, gamma tilde, times my function F R, or F left of alpha, times something else here, beta belongs to B of the sum over everything that belongs to beta, delta gamma, gamma tilde tilde, f on the right, that depends on beta. Now it's very hard not to call this n left, 
and call this and write. So I've proven to you that any amplitude any amplitude m that it started its life like this can be written as the sum over all trivalent graphs of some numerators that were constructed entirely in terms of this Now you can start replacing them, putting different, different kinds of numerators, right? So an exercise for you is to show that, so we want to get, it's clear that if we start with young meals and young meals, right, we're going to get gravity. But how do we get young meals from these formulas? Okay, take a left, this vector that has some index alpha, and take it to be, you see, so far, I haven't made use of anything that has to do with the scattering equations or anything like that. This is something that we have proven, and now we can forget how we got it, okay? So this is something that just depends on the, on the objects that we're putting inside there. So let's take this guy to be the following. Here I'm choosing 1 through n, sorry, actually 1 up to n. And here I'm going to put is that what I want? Yes. OK. So what theory on this side do you think I get? If here I put the Young Mills partial amplitudes. So I'm going to put on the right So here is a question for you. If I take this strange combination of objects on this side and this on the right, what would I get what would M be? Just when you thought you were understanding, now I come out with a question that seems to be completely, <laughs> why, why, why would you introduce this trace? Wasn't everything color, didn't have any color, it was color. Is what? Is what? The bioengineering scalar. scalar. Well, it couldn't be because we have, we have polarization vectors in the, in the formula. So one of the two sizes has polarization vectors, and therefore this guy should also have polarization vectors. This guy doesn't have any polarization vectors. So whatever theory I'm going to construct has polarization vectors. Right, so it cannot be a scalar theory. What is it? A scalar with polarization? No. Coupled to, to gauge theory. Well, not quite. Well, let's write it in terms of uh, let's, let, let's write this thing as a matrix, so if you want. So let's, we have this trace, TA1 up to TAN. So let me see, is that what I want? No, actually, yes, so I wanted the alphas here. But that's why you couldn't figure it out. Is that, is that what I want, the alphas there? Um, Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'll tell you what I want, and then you can help me see, find out what is it that I have to put in there. So, what is going to happen is that we're going to have these trays written in the correct way, which I still don't know what it is, times m, right? This matrix m, times m inverse, times the partial amplitudes in Young Mills. So we have m with some index alpha times beta times m inverse with the beta contracted here times gamma times the partial amplitudes of Young Mills with index gamma. But now I have m times m inverse. So I'm locking these two indices. And I'm getting trace of t with this thing with a on the for the index alpha. So I get Young Mills here. So indeed, if I want to match this color structure with this thing here, I need the alphas there. So it's alpha one. Okay, so what is this object? Is the color dress partial amplitude with its friend, the trace, that has all the structure constants. So if I now put this into, the, into this machinery, I'm going to end up with a numerator that has all the color structure, right? And this numerator here will not have any polarization vectors. So this is the numerator that only has color. So this is what we call in the color kinematic duality C. So if I make this replacement, this implies is that the numerator on the left is what we would call the C factor that contains only the color structure, all structure constants are, are in there. And n right is what is called little n, which is the one that has the kinematics, the polarization vectors and all that. And now you see that from the formulas and everything we have proven, you can exchange them and get different theories. You can get the bias joint by putting two copies of this, putting one of these, one of these, you get Jack Mills, and by putting two of these guys, you get gravity, okay? And your homework is actually very, very interesting, so you should try it. Is to prove, which could be a question that you have right now in your minds, but the homework or the final project of this course is the following. Proof that any n constructed in this way satisfies something like that the Jacobi like identity. You remember a basic assumption of the BCJ construction that I explained the first day was that these numerators, anything that they were, were supposed to satisfy the same identities that the colors satisfy, and color only satisfies its Jacobi identities. So your job is to prove that any numerators constructed in this way, where I didn't use any color kinematics duality, actually, satisfy the relations that they are supposed to satisfy. Okay, so let me stop here. One bigger theory, amplitude-wise. The resulting uh, amplitude satisfies the crossing symmetry? Satisfies its crossing symmetry. Assuming that the individual one... The individual ones do. Yes, I think so. Is it obvious to you? Or? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's straightforward from the structure of the, of the construction, right? Um, so if you assume that each of the left and right theories, right, satisfies the, they satisfy crossing, crossing symmetry by themselves, then, then it must be true that the other one does, because you can just change channels simultaneously 
and it will have to give you the new amplitude on the other side. Well, this all relies on the, on the proof that the two sides are the same, right? Everyone wants to go and take a break. <laughs> So from this uh, trivalent graph decompositions, can it be said that gravity amplitudes, which has all the quartic uh, vertices, they can be captured in some trivalent vertices? So gravity, you mean, you said gravity? Yeah, gravity. Well, but gravity. gravity also has cubic couplings, right? Yeah, uh, so like, uh, so four-point vertices, five-point vertices? Say, yeah, so that's very good. Well, even from BCFW, we knew that gravity could be constructed just by knowing the cubic couplings. But so it, it didn't come as a surprise to, to think that gravity could be constructed or written in this form. Remember that gravity has all order vertices, right? But anything that you want, give me a seven point vertex. I can expand it in cubic couplings by, in cubic vertices by cheating and put in numerators. In fact, the more things you have, the more freedom you have for, for expanding these things into cubic couplings. Yeah, so that that um, that was a question. Uh, who had it, Shiraz, or I, I think I think you, or oh, it was Shiraz. Yes, uh, yesterday. And uh, the answer is, it should be possible. Most likely, the arguments that will go more or less along the arguments of Maldacena, Edelstein, and, and friends. So you could try to take their paper and see if there is something new that you could do or that you could learn in this formalism. That would be that would be very nice. Yes, yes, that's right. In fact, there is a formulation of the same scattering equations at three level that replaces the sphere by a double copy of the sphere, where you have now two spheres connected by a branch cut. That topologically is the same as a sphere, but now the branch cut can be thought of as a branch cut where you have committed yourself to a particular channel. So. Now you have an, a description of the amplitudes in a particular channel. Now, what is crossing symmetry? So how, how would it manifest itself? Well, here you have to take the particles or the punctures and actually make them cross the branch cut. So crossing is literally crossing, but you cross the branch cut. So showing that you have crossing symmetry would correspond to showing that you can move across the branch cut without paying any penalties, and the answers turn out to be the uh, equivalent. Uh, yep, there are there are things one can try to to explore. 